morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone who will eventually listen to this message. Thanks so much for um, having me here at LACSC. Um, I could introduce myself. My, okay, so my name is Sam. That's probably the most important thing, okay, that you know uh, who's delivering the Lord's message to you guys this morning. Um, I am a friend of a friend of a friend, maybe even of a friend, okay? So um, I'm not really anyone like super important. Um, however, I do, I do believe that God's word is, is very important, okay? And so um, if, if you have questions about who this guy who's telling you about the Bible is this morning, um, you know, we can talk after, I guess. Uh, but I think it's much more well served for me to use my time delivering the Lord's word, okay? Um, I wanted to express my gratitude one more time to LACAC for the invitation to come and preach this morning, and just wanted to extend a, a special thanks to you guys um, and, you know, guys and gals for allowing your pastor to take what I'm sure is a good and well-deserved sabbatical. Um, like I said, I do not know Pastor Keone personally, but what I have learned in the very short moments of being here this morning and just prepping with you guys, he's been here for 10 years, you know, and um, the guy was supposed to get his sabbatical, I think, pre-pandemic, and then we all know what that was like, and with the Holy Spirit, he, he pushed through it, right? Um, and so it's more than well-deserved, and so I just wanted to recognize you guys um, for allowing you know, the servant of God to, to take his rest and take his break, um, you know, when he, when he needs and when him and his family need it. And so thank you guys. And once again, thank you for allowing me to be here. Okay. So um, I want to spend my time this morning preaching on the short book of Haggai. Okay. So you're, you might be saying where, what, who. Uh, I love preaching out of the darker, dustier <laughs> corners of the Bible because a lot of the times when we don't talk about those books of the Bible, they tend to become a little bit more inaccessible to us, okay? But all of God's word is supposed to be accessible to us. And so I want to take a short um, little stint. And if you wanted to read the book on yourself, you could do that. It's only two chapters, very brief, okay? You can find it best probably if you're in your Bibles, if you're in your apps, you're, you just got to scroll down, okay? But if you're in your Bibles, you're probably best served turning to the middle of the Bible, right, which is like right where the Old Testament ends and the New begins, and going backwards, okay? You'll find it almost right there, okay? But, uh, yeah, if you want to turn there or swipe there, that would be great, and we'll be reading out of Haggai chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. Uh, I should have done my homework uh, Grace Jordan and, and probably or Enoch and asked like what translation of the Bible you guys use. I use the ESV. So if if we're on the same page, great. If we're not, then bear with me. Okay. Um, yeah. So Haggai chapter one verses three through eight. I'll read through it and then I'll give a quick prayer. Okay. All right. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm, and he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and, br and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Let's pray. God, um, we thank you so much for a faithful church with faithful people. Um, you know, I, I kind of feel like I'm doing a superfluous job. It kind of, um, I feel like uh, your servant, uh, Enoch, did a, did a bang-up job giving a, a mini-sermon uh, beforehand. And so, God, I just want to carry on the work that you've given um, for me 
and to uh, just bring your people here at LACAC, LACAC back to the wellspring of life just one more time um, as a family on, on, your, on your worship morning. And so, Lord, be with us, and I ask that you would just, Holy Spirit, just be with me. Help it not to be my words, but help it to be yours. We thank you for this time. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so uh, in our story today, we catch up with the Jews who have recently come out of exile, okay? So if you guys are at all familiar with the, the timeline of the Old Testament, um, they were under Persian rule, uh, and it was all because of their covenant unfaithfulness to God, right? They were worshiping other gods, and, um, you know, Enoch was talking about being hospitable to one another. Well, they weren't, okay? In fact, they had shown time and time again that they could not be trusted with the Lord their God's commands and directives, okay? And so they had treated one of each other terribly, and they were, uh, a, they were guilty of apostasy, okay? And so because of that, God exiles them from the promised land via the invasion of neighboring empires, okay? And so there, there they were taken away under, to live under Babylonian rule, then the Persians, and this whole account you guys can read through the book of Daniel, okay? They return 70 years later. So they are under captive exile for 70 years, okay? And as they return, the Persian king says, hey, all right, you guys can return, and you can start rebuilding your homeland, right? Um, a lot of the rebuilding account you can read through Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, but today we're, we're going through the book of Haggai, okay? And they, they've returned to their homeland 70 years later, and now they've returned to a situation that is probably only vaguely familiar, okay? I'm sure the land look, looked very different from 70 years ago when the, perhaps the parents or maybe even the grandparents were stripped and exiled from the promised land. And what used to be one family's home was probably another family's home now, right? In fact, scholars say that more than likely what would have happened is as they took the Jews away from their land, they would have implanted Samaritans into the land and taken over all the houses that the Jews originally lived in, okay? So the children's children of those who were exiled would only have clues to where to start in the stories passed down by their parents and their grandparents, okay? They would have to start all over from scratch, right? And they would have to kind of scratch and claw to survive. Make sense? You're still clawing, uh, still clawing, still tracking with me? Each person or family would have to scrounge for essentials just to begin life anew in what was probably a very chaotic and overwhelming uh, situation. Uh, I think that this situation that the Jews find themselves in is plenty relatable for you and I here in 2022, okay? We are also trying to come back to an old and familiar reality but not really able to start from where we stopped three years ago, right? Um, the end of the pandemic, but we still all have our masks off. We're still very compliant, and we're still super kind of concerned about the spread of illness, right? Um, the economic ripples uh, from all of that situation, supply chain shortages, uh, the conflict in Ukraine, that's also complicated things, right? Uh, it means that we've had to accept kind of a new normal, right? And try to make some sense of all of the chaos and kind of the overwhelming nature of all of it, yeah? I think even just to speak to this past week, if you've been, if you, you know, take stock of current events or things that are happening in just our country here in the United States, right? Um, from Washington, D.C., all the news that is coming out, all the the, the hearings, some of uh, new legislation that was kind of batted down, old legislation that was overturned, 
there's a lot of chaos that can make us feel kind of overwhelmed in just how we're trying to eke out a living and survive here in 2022, right? Um, and I think that it would be totally under, understood and no one can be blamed for feeling the overwhelmingness and want to just kind of cut off the world and go back into turtle mode, right? To go back to just being in survival. However, in today's passage, I, I want us to see that, that God is calling us to not just survive as we come out of our homes and start to rebuild, but he's calling us to thrive, okay? And thriving involves reorientating our lives towards him and towards one another. And I want us to see that when we do this, that God is pleased and that God is glorified, okay? So let's read and start with verses three and four, okay? It says, then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? All right, well, we, we see that the chief ways that the Jews have chosen to restart their lives is by rebuilding their homes. Yep, um, seemingly nothing wrong with, uh, with that. Shelter is an essential need, and I don't think God is sending his prophet uh, this message because the Jews are building houses, okay? So then what is, what is it about rebuilding that God is so concerned about? Well, it's not that the Jews have built houses for themselves that God takes exception to. Rather, it's that the Jews have preoccupied themselves with building up their own security while neglecting what is important, their relationship with God. When God talks about his house lying in ruins, he's talking about the temple, okay? So uh, see the little history on the temple? The temple was very important at the time because for the Jews, uh, the temple was where the presence of the Lord resided amongst his people. Okay? This was the place where the people came to reconcile their relationships uh, corporately and individually with the Lord. Right? It, was, it was a place where they offered sacrifices to cover over sin. It was also the place where they came to offer thanksgiving for God's faithfulness. The temple was the place where God's people met him and one another during their times of blessing and their times of brokenness. It was the spiritual, relational, and at the, same, and at the time, geographical focal point between God and his people and the people with one another. Okay? So I think that I've, I've painted a pretty decent picture of how instrumental the Lord's temple was to Israel and his remnant. And not just their survival, but their ability to thrive right? This was why God takes exception with his house laying in ruins while all the Jews are kind of building up their mansions, okay? So the fact that the Lord's people were more concerned with their own houses than his house concerned him, and it ought to concern us as well, okay? So let's read verses 5 and 6. It says, now therefore, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Now, I, I don't think that God is telling them that physically they weren't working hard enough, okay, or earning enough. All, all of you guys, like, I see your diligence and your faithfulness. No one's telling you that you're not working hard enough, okay, or earning enough. This is a matter of satisfaction and fulfillment in life that they found elusive 
and that they lacked, right? God's point was that satisfaction, despite their efforts, eluded them. They lacked fulfillment. Satisfaction and fulfillment eluded them because they had neglected God's presence in their lives. Survival had forced them into an unhealthy spiritual and relational independence from the Lord and from one another. You, you don't have to raise your hands, okay? Um, but how many, how many of us in the last three years have struggled with depending on our relationship with the Lord for fulfillment and satisfaction? Okay? Um, instead, we just kind of opt to just kind of figure it out on our own. Right? It's all too relatable. Okay? If you, in your heart, raise your hands, so did I. Okay? No one's judging you here. When the bills are due, when inflation is driving up the prices of everything, um, how about when, you know, for college students, when finals are coming up, um, maybe for graduates, you have to find a job, right? I know there were some praise reports about finding jobs. Great, wonderful. Um, when, the, when the news is depressing and overwhelming, and, and as I mentioned, we still have to keep ourselves and our families healthy. Um, it's much easier to lean away from dependence on God and one another and just kind of rely on ourselves instead of asking for help. It's much easier to turtle back in. Okay? But through Haggai, God tells us that that unhealthy brand of independence, it costs us something. Right? Our satisfaction and our fulfillment that can only be found from our relationship with him and the purpose that our relationships with him gives to all of the things that we do. That's what it costs us when we decide on this unhealthy brand of independence. This is why God is so concerned with the remnant of Israel being so preoccupied with their houses and not his. He's reminding them and us that he is the source of our fullness and satisfaction in life. Now, fortunately, God is merciful, and he always gives his people some kind of breadcrumb clue, right? Give them a choice in how they can live their lives, okay? Um, the key to making things right, and so he clues them in on how to live their lives and how we can live our lives of faith in fullness to his pleasure, and to his glory. Because remember, that's what gives us fulfillment and satisfaction in what we do. Okay, verses 7 and 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. God tells the Jews to do what is necessary for his presence to be back amongst his people, which for post-exile Jews was rebuilding the temple, right? God wants us to be amongst his people so he may take pleasure in their worship and be glorified. Now, um, this doesn't necessarily translate to, you know, LACAC here in 2022, you guys have a beautiful church, okay? You have a beautiful church, and, um, you know, we just went through a pandemic. And so I'm sure that just, just like uh, the church that I was a part of, you guys during the pandemic had to think of a lot of different creative ways to keep worship going, right? We can pretty much worship anywhere, any way, okay? We really had to be creative, okay? So, it doesn't translate so well. Well, well then how, how do we apply God's call and his command for us in our lives here in 2022, okay? How do we build back up the Lord's house to his pleasure and to his glory? Well, in Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle Paul says this, okay? For through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens 
with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The Apostle Paul says uh, that because of Jesus, we all have the same access through the Holy Spirit to our Father in heaven and our fellow citizens of the kingdom and family members of God's household, just like the apostles and the prophets, including the author of our book today, Haggai, who were so foundational to our faith. Paul says that all together we as the believers become the Lord's structure. We together corporately usher in the presence of God. The kicker, the cornerstone, which is the very first stone set down when building a structure. So I'm not, not an engineer, not a structural engineer, just a dude who talks on Sunday, okay? Um, but, you know, a lot of the things that I've read and a lot of the things that I've heard uh, cornerstone, super important. Okay? First stone set down when building a structure, its importance is invaluable. Okay? It's the stone upon which every subsequent stone for a structure references. Okay? If that cornerstone, that first stone that is put down, is in any way askew, then you have a faulty structure. Make sense? Paul says that Jesus himself, the perfect stone, is our structure's cornerstone. And when he is our cornerstone, we become the Lord's temple. Isn't that crazy? Because his righteousness changes the way that we relate to our Father in heaven, it changes the way that we relate to one another. So then how does this work for all of us here at LACAC? Practically, how does it work? How do we live our lives to the fullest with satisfaction as the Lord's temple, interlocked with Christ and with one another to God's pleasure and to his glory? Hebrews 10 says this. It says, And let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're called to meet together. We're called to meet together. Some of you guys went on a camping trip. Love that. You know, senior pastor's gone on his sabbatical. Who cares, man? We still got a church. We still got a family. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know what I'm saying, okay? We care about Pastor Keone very much, okay? But there's still a family here. There's still a community. There's still a gathering of people, isn't there? There's still beauty. There's still God's temple. You are still God's temple, right? Just because Pastor Keone has gone in Korea doesn't mean that the cornerstone has disappeared. Pastor Keone is not the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. That's the only ad-libbed part of this sermon. But it's true. We're called to continue to meet. We are called to be vigilant and not neglect about our gathering and investing into the fellowship of our communities of faith. But it isn't just about meeting, so I want to I want to really paint this out for you guys, okay? Because it isn't just about meeting, all right? If you consider yourself a believer, you care and invest into the content of your meetings with the fellow members of God's household. What do I mean by that? The author of Hebrews exhorts us to stir one another up in love and good works and also to encourage one another. In other words, we need to help one another love others and share God's blessings with others who need it 
while encouraging one another when we become weary or disheartened, right? In between church gatherings on Sundays, it's very easy to become overwhelmed because you're by yourself and the news is crazy right now. All the more important to keep your gathering so that way you can encourage yourself when you yourself are feeling like your, your gas tank is empty. This requires much more than just the act of meeting. Because you can be weary in life and disheartened in your own desire to be loved and experience seasons where you need to receive the good works of others in your lives. If I can be absolutely frank, I was, you know, telling some of the servants here that, you know, I, I've had to leave my church situation. It's been about six months now, right? Uh, my wife has a chronic illness, and so my first ministry has become her, and it always has been her, which is why I've had to make a difficult decision, right? And one of the things that I personally struggle with in this season is loneliness, okay? I dare say that I'm not the only one, okay? I think a great many of us are dealing with loneliness in this season. And there's great reason to feel loneliness. This might be because we are defaulting on just the act of meeting and neglecting the other parts of connecting in relationship with others in love and good works. Right? It may be because you need encouragement, but you are still adjusting to re-socializing yourself to friends, family, and church members, right? I remember coming out of pandemic, all of my friends, we'd get together and we were a little bit more awkward for all of the, you know, for all of the, the, the cabin fever we had gotten. We just got so used to being by ourselves that all of us at our first friend gathering were kind of like, so awkward, right? So it takes a little bit of time of adjustment. And many of us are having to start from scratch in our social lives and rebuilding our support structures since the pandemic. But that's why it's all the more important that we lean into the community of believers at this time because old adages like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, it, it's really doing us a disservice when we are being invited and called by the Lord into relationships of trust and dependence, inter. And independence is the last thing that we need right now. Uh, I watched some um, some TED Talks about loneliness. Um, I'm like, I, I live in 2022, just like you guys. And so um, I went to Google before I went to my Bible, which is a, a terrible thing to admit. Okay? I'm human. I watched some TED Talks about loneliness, and, and one takeaway was about the need for ritual community. Okay? It's a place and a group of people who you meet with on an interval basis where you feel safe enough to be yourself and also just be. No posturing, no fronting, no pretense. And if you're here today and you regularly are present, then you have half of the crux of the message down, right? You're, you're good at ritual, Okay? But as I've been trying to explain to us this morning, God is pleased and glorified when we're able to live our lives in fullness with satisfaction and purpose because we engage in relationship with him and with one another. Okay? A gathering where, whether it's online or physical, whether it's church organized, I know that, you know, um, fellowship groups are going to be canceled for a little while. You don't have to meet on the church's program. You can say, hey, I heard you had a prayer request. You want to get some coffee? Right? I'm Korean, but I love dim sum. You want to go some, do you want to get some dim sum? You can do this. It doesn't take organization by the church for you to be the Lord's temple. It's a group where we can come and ask for help in our brokenness and receive love and encouragement from one another. See, that, my friends, is ritual community.
community, right? Not just the, the thing that you repeat all the time, but the content of what you're repeating is deep and it's full and it's purposeful and it satisfies you. And it fuels you and it refuels you for the chaos of the rebuilding that you enter into from Monday through Saturday. The more you meet, the better. And it's what the Lord desires for us as Christians, returning to church, returning to fellowship groups, returning to our places of work, returning to our family, returning to our friends, to rebuild. Um, anyone ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Anybody? Okay, you guys, all citizens of 2022, congratulations, okay? It's, it's this uh, psychological pyramid that points out basic and foundational survival needs that everyone requires for healthy growth and development, right? Now, um, if, you, if you look at the picture, thank you, Jordan. The, the bottom two layers make sense, okay? We, we all have physiological needs. We need food, water, warmth, and rest, right? Um, we need to feel safe. We need, uh, uh, we need to feel safe and secure to function well, right? It's hard to function when we do not feel safe or secure, okay? And we all seem to know how to operate in life without much help from others in this regard, okay? But then the doorway to healthy growth and development for our inner person seems to start with our need for relationships, and all of us need help with that, right? You cannot become the grown part of yourself as an island. Okay, we all need help with that. Christians and non-Christians alike need help with that because we all have independent streaks and no one likes looking broken or needy and we're all so much more lonelier for it, right? If your normal posture when you come to church is, I better put on my Sunday best and look real good, then you may be missing the point. If I, if I could, as a believer, kind of tweak Maslow's pyramid, I would, I would put another foundational level under even our basic needs, okay? Um, I think that's the thank you. The new bottom layer is the benefit of our relationship with our cornerstone, Jesus, Okay? He being the one who healed our fractured relationship with our Father in heaven from the cross and also gives us the hope of deeper relationships in our community. Okay? The Jews, um, I want to give you a spoiler, but once again, there's two chapters if you want to read it later on. Okay? The Jews would eventually choose to obey the Lord. Yay! Okay? For once. Okay? The Jews would choose to obey the words of Haggai, relayed from the Lord, um, and were able to intuit that the foundation of their ability to survive and thrive would be the Lord, right? And because as they came to rebuild the house of the Lord, this is the message that awaited them, okay? Verse 13. Last slide. It says, then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. Okay? I'll close with this. Brothers and sisters of LACAC, the Lord desires for us to live lives of fullness, of satisfaction, and lives of purpose. Okay? Um, my prayer is that we'll remember that the key to that satisfaction and that fulfillment and that purpose is in seeking God's pleasure and God's glory and that he is pleased and glorified when we lean out of our independence and lean into our relationships with him and with one another. Okay? And with Jesus as our cornerstone, we can create a community of grace and safety and love for all who may come 
And as we take risks in relating and connecting with one another um, and doing the hard work of rebuilding our community, that we would be strengthened with the reminder that God is with us. I know that, uh, you know, once again, that Pastor Keone is gone on sabbatical, but I think once again, as a reminder, this is something that all of us as Christians can strive to, even if he's not here. And quite honestly, it's something that every believer, not pastor or organizer or leader, but every Christian has a responsibility to. And so I pray that this message will help this church community to really come together, not just survive, but to really thrive and grow all the more until Pastor Keone returns. Let's pray. God, thanks so much for your word today. And um, Holy Spirit, once again, it's not the things that I say, but it's, it's the things that you say to each person in, in the groanings. Um, and so, God, I just ask that you would just use the, use the text of Haggai that you've given to your people here at LACAC, that you would just filter our hearts through them, um, and that you would just help us to be more like you um, today and this coming week, God. Challenge us with this word today. Encourage those who need to be picked up, God. Um, many of us do. And so be with us. We thank you. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen.